The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. Yeah, so this is a little Ellen uh, history, just to have a little sense of where she's coming, her journey. She's, she arrived at Esalen back in, a, um, in about the early 80s, 84 or so. She's 36 years old, and she was widowed and twice divorced. I had a lot of experience. And in need of healing of all, in all ways possible. <laughs> so the psycho-spiritual challenges in her family of origin, along with her own relationship dramas and traumas, which we all have in some level, uh, demanded attention, sorry, Having owned a successful gift business in Atlanta, been a commodities trader in Fort Worth, and a Playboy bunny. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that before. <laughs> no surprise. Provided Ellen with a varied uh, work background, with, obviously, and with an accounting education and training in international cuisine, uh, gardening, and movement arts, Ellen found immediate long-term work-study opportunities at Esalen. That's how I eventually, that's how I got, got to Esalen with the World's Work Study program. And a uh, great, great thing to do. In 1984, Esalen uh, became Ellen's home, healing ground and educational center. A member of the healing arts staff and faculty, since 1985, Ellen birthed the movement arts program at Esalen in 1985. In, in 1985. In 1996, she founded Moving Ventures School, headquartered in Bali offering vocational education to minimum wage earning women in Indonesia. Um, Moving Ventures offers trainings in Esalen massage and bodywork, touching essence and spirit dance soul song, and other somatic healing art forms. And uh, one thing I'm sure Ellen will discuss tonight to someone, so I don't want to steal all of your thunder, but she had uh, the opportunity whilst at Alice Esalen, as I did, to meet some of the great pioneers and great researchers in, in this very exciting area of human inquiry. And, uh, I, you know, we're at, the, we're at the, the wave of the psychedelic renaissance is peaking and it's building momentum. And this crowd, based on almost no promotion, literally, <laughs> very little, look at this, it's fantastic. So you guys are great, thanks for coming out tonight. My dear friend, the, the one and the only, Ellen Watson. to be here with you and to be able to talk about this I feel like I've been in the closet for the last 20 years because the door slammed shut in the mid 80s when MDMA was put on schedule one and a play Esalen which was um, one of the major locations in this country where psychedelics were allowed and explored in the 60s and 70s those three practices that John just mentioned were a derivation or created as a result of psychedelic exploration. And all of the meeting rooms at Esalen were host to inquiry of how can I be a better body worker? How can I be a better rolfer? How can I be a better yogini or yogi or a movement artist of any kind, how can I use these experiences to more fully embody myself and be present? And then we've gone through this last 20 years yeah. with none of that even talked about. It became a sin to talk about it. It didn't appear in the catalog. And it's good to be, still be alive today to realize we're having a renaissance. As John just mentioned, that it's a rebirth almost, that we had to die to the old way, and now we're returning to a new way. And thank God we have the internet now and social networking, and we can spread information much more effectively than we could 30 years ago or 25 years ago. And before I launch off on uh, some topic that you may not be interested in, I'd love to hear from you what brought you out tonight. 
what is it that I might know something about that you want to know? So would you just popcorn style tell me? So say anything? I'll say something. Um, in my 20s, when I was just interested in exploring things for primarily entertainment and recreation, um, I thought, okay, been there, done that, lots of entertaining things. And now, um, in my 50s, I'm very interested in continued evolution of consciousness and um, how these might really uh, contribute to that. So that's something that if it kind of naturally can be woven into anything we talk about, given your experience, I would be yeah. very grateful. Did everyone hear? Could you hear? Consciousness, the evolution of consciousness. Anyone else have something? Yes. I'm curious. I heard, I read in the bio about you've done a number of sits with a number of psychedelics, uh, your time in Esalen, and perhaps outside of that, just as far as sitting with uh, other participants. Okay. And if you're able to speak to that experience at all, I'm curious okay. to hear some more. Will do. Um, experience with psilocybin, but had an experience that kind of scared me a little mm -hmm. bit, and I'd like to know, kind of, in that um, process with discovering the self, there, there's some scary parts to it, oh, and, definitely. <laughs> and I'd like to know experience or it. Okay. Ellen, well, can you repeat the question? Yes, so this question, what's your name? Lindsay. Lindsay had listened to some podcasts, Terrence podcasts and had an experience on psilocybin that brought up some fear. And so she wants to talk a little bit about that, about fear. And, and just as you move forward, because I'm, I'm not turned off to the experience, I want right. to experience more. Okay. And kind of how you break through that feeling. <laughs> okay. Another hand I saw, oh, that's it, several. Well, I remember, you know, I'm old enough to remember the big scare with Timothy Leary and what was fascinating before the panic that there'd been a lot of research on using things like LSD in actual, you know, tests to see what you can use it to cure um, things like alcoholism and heroin addiction. These are legal research projects that suddenly, because of all the Timothy Leary stuff, it was all like made illegal. And no one really knew about it. People just thought there was this crazy Harvard guy who was partying. No one knew that there was this whole period when it was like a valid research topic mm -hmm. and then the hysteria is locked in. And it's, it seems like, you know, there's real hope that people are back <coughs> once the hysteria is decided to hopefully run now. Okay. I, th I think I get it. <coughs> that valid research was taking place. Mm -hmm. At the time, the door swung open and uh -huh. Timothy Leary and Ram Das, Richard Alpert, decided that the best the best way to do this was to turn turn everybody on, tune in, and drop out, which caused a bit of uh, social chaos. And so those in charge of keeping social order decided to slam the door. So that was detrimental to the larger picture, to have it done that way. It, they, these, these substances are not appropriate for us to take and drive cars. And <laughs> the set I wrote a bunch of little notes up here and set and setting. The proper mindset, which helps with your question, and the proper physical setting are primary. Those would be the first two aspects of a psychedelic session for heightening consciousness that we pay attention to. Yeah, uh, I'd be grateful if you could discuss maybe your ideas or strategies on how to best discuss psychedelics in educational curriculum. Okay. So how do we make it a, a main part of our education system, starting at a young age? Everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. How do we bring it more into mainstream as an education, a topic of education? I'm a therapist, and I'd be really curious to hear, you know, about any of your experiences using psychedelics for you know, deep emotional therapeutic work, either with yourself or with other people. Okay. I'd like to hear a story of your experience with Terrence McKenna, like early on, yeah. where you went, oh my. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anything else? 
We'll have a period after I'm through talking for more questions and answers. Yes. Um, one of the things that's always on the, my mind that I find fascinating is death and letting go. And so just kind of how that relates to the experience that can be had on this. Okay. Death and letting go. Something we all have to do every day in some form, in some fashion, with some issue, I'd say, aside from the great big one. start with with that so how do we create an integrated life using plant medicine or other of these medicines entheogens and pathogens or synthesized potions like LSD how do we use that to create a more balanced integrated life between somatics and the psyche is that what you were asking yeah and then that downloads to everyday life practice. I can answer in my own personal journey. Um, coming out of the South, I'd lived most of my life in the South before I went to Esalen, and consciousness was not particularly high on the radar screen. <laughs> and <laughs> I had honestly only briefly heard of psychedelics. I had a um, an opinion and a judgment based on not much experience about all genre of medicine that affected the brain and the psyche. My mother was schizophrenic, her sister was bipolar, and I grew up in a very bizarre behavioral situation. Lots of love. I never did feel unloved. It was just the strangest behavior of two women I could possibly imagine. <laughs> and so I had this quest to understand because nothing that was available in the 50s and the 60s could touch these two um, very disturbing situations. And my, I saw over 50 psychiatrists attempting to find help for my mother. And then there was, of course, the question, was this going to happen to me? I had the same genetic heritage, and was I going to trip over that line? And when I arrived at Esalen, I found Stan Groff. I took a workshop with him in the first two weeks, and that was Stan, if you don't know who Stan is, he's still living, and he's one of the most articulate, broadly based, inquiring minds I've ever been exposed to. And his quest as a young um, researcher he wanted to understand schizophrenia and bipolar, or manic depressive disorder, as it was called then. And he lived in Czechoslovakia. And the only study he could do was Freudian analysis. Well, you can imagine getting a good schizophrenic to sit down and analyze. <laughs> but forget that as a viable treatment. And Albert Hoffman, when he discovered LSD, he sent samples to all the research psychiatrists in the world that he knew about and said, take this yourself, don't give it to your patient, and take it under this protocol and report to me your experience. And it was then that Stan had a direct experience with Creator, with God. He was an agnostic. He had no opinion whatsoever about a greater being and downloaded to him if you want to understand schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, do this. So he began his inquiry into how indigenous cultures all over the world dealt with non-ordinary states of consciousness. And so it was through breath work and through sound, sounding of all kinds, music, and touch, body work. And that 
fueled him in creating holotropic breathwork, which was an offshoot of the over 3,000 LSD sessions he did for the National Institutes of Health in Spring Grove, Maryland. And he was invited once Timothy Leary and the boys acted up to the point that it became illegal to do continue this work, he was invited to Esalen, which because of its remote location in the 1950s, the sheriff didn't even come down there because he was afraid he'd get shot. <laughs> so it was a lawless part of our country and of this state at the time, so most anything went during those years. So he continued his research and brought in not only LSD, but ayahuasca and, ayahuasca and ayahuascaras. And he used the big house at Esalen as his laboratory for attempting to understand how these medicines could be used to heal trauma. I know there was a question about healing trauma. Well, I was totally traumatized by my first 36 years of life and needed all the help I could get. You know, I had married a man who was physically abusive and my mother in her schizophrenia was very strangely abusive to me as an infant and young child. And so I had stored in my tissues lots of issues. And I don't know that I would have ever really worked through those as effectively as I have without the help of these medicines. So it's, as I said, set in setting, then, and that was how I was introduced, because I had a no thank you, I don't want stelazine or thorazine or mm, 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 I will not take, do anything that interferes with my functioning of my brain. So it took a little education, again, how do we bring, and I had great teachers. Terrence McKenna was one. He was the more lunatic friend. <laughs> and the outrageous one, while Stan was more the scholar, and then Terrence's brother, Dennis, who is a scholar and has a PhD, so he went that route, and Terrence just stayed sort of on the fringe. And I had these remarkable people, and then others who had been inducted into psychedelic sitting, sitting with others, who were my sitters. So I couldn't have arrived at a better time and a better place to have what I needed. It was as if central casting put all the characters needed for my healing all in one location. And there I was. So that's why I fell into that place, aside from its magical beauty, the natural beauty and the, the healing energy that is intrinsic. Have all you been? Have you been to Esalen? Do you even you know what we're talking about? I don't think it would really matter what we did there. The, the, the land itself and the hot springs and the cold water that runs freely down and the water that falls out of the sky and the ocean all converge and we then understand why the Native Americans, the Esalen tribe, the Esalen Indians for whom that was home for thousands of years called it their healing ground, their sacred ground, their burial ground, their garden. And I don't know quite how the Spanish got it away from them, but we can imagine. And now that it's in our hands, and thank heaven that the Murphy family has opened it up to so many people being able to go and experience what a version of what I experienced, experienced there because of its setting on the cliffs overlooking the Pacific, a sense of expansion and liberation. Those are the two root words of Tantra. Tan, expansion, tra, liberation. And I can say before I knew what that meant, that's what I experienced. When I got out of my car and I walked out there, it was, that was it. So, and then, the icing on the cake was all these people in the practices. Um, Terrence. I, the, I had to have a dictionary when I listened to him in the early days to even know what he was saying. A wordsmith of unparalleled capacity. To, and he talked slowly. 
So he was able to choose each word as he spoke. I always felt like I was listening to a mushroom talk. <laughs> <laughs> but on every word I hung, because of what he had to say was not only wrong true, but he was a visionary. Uh, I was speaking with, what, yeah, who knew Terrence and was helping him with his last book, which didn't get published. I didn't get quite out there with the machine elves that, you know, and the artificial intelligence that was going to come in 2012 and take over the running of the universe. So that particular version was not what captivated me. It was the Archaic Revival. One of his books, The Archaic Revival, which was bringing into, more de into this century and the last century the ancient wisdom teachings of other cultures through plant medicine. He and Dennis, his brother, had journeyed down into Central and South America in, in search of several plants and on the search found ayahuasca and propagated plants brought them to Hawaii where he owned land and began growing Monasteriopsis copy and explored with other admixtures what would make the most useful brew. And once he got it brewed, he brought it to Esalen and I had the great fortune to have some of that first medicine. And my first experience was a low dose and I felt beautiful from the, every cell, from the inside out, delicious. I saw music notes in the, I mean, it was just this totally wonderful, ochre colored, all the colors of the Amazon, the plants, everybody talked to me, the plants talked to me. And my sitter who knew me said, you didn't have quite enough. So he doubled the dose three weeks later, and I had a very different experience. And uh, a healing experience for six hours that was cathartic and um, a lot of it not in my conscious memory, but I had three sitters for that and they took care of me, and I unloaded a lot of baggage, we can say. And so set, setting, dose, intention are all such important components and you asked me about sitting someone like what is the role of a sitter it's not a guide we're, we're not guiding anyone if we trust the medicine we're taking then the act of sitting for someone is just that you keep the space safe you keep the experiencer safe from hurting themselves, from jumping out the window, you know, because they think they can fly. They're having an experience of, of weightlessness and taking flight. So we help keep them safe if we're sitting. And we might ask a question, but we don't give answers. So we're not guiding people. And the way to learn to really sit is through experience to be set for and to sit with hundreds of people, whether it's on psychedelics or whether it's in communication, to actively listen and sit, whether it is um, in the holotropic breathwork, that's part of the three-year training, is hundreds of breathwork sessions as both breather and sitter, and learning one's own Am I, um, do I need to be needed? Do I need to take care of you? And if that is part of my trip, part of how I'm wound, then I need to really work on stopping that impulse. If I tend to be too aloof and I let somebody drown watching them, then I need to be more proactive and do something to help this person. I did, I was part of a, a program in Bali where the belief is if you die in Bali, 
you die there because you want to be reborn there because that's the belief system and these men watched a woman who couldn't swim drown in the shallow end of a pool because they thought she wanted to be reborn in Bali. And honestly, she did. I don't know if she wanted to be reborn. She wanted to move to Bali <laughs> from China. <laughs> so, again, it, this, it's this getting to know impulse, intention, know yourself. What is ego-based and what is essence-based? What comes from a true knowing or if it's just a pattern? That, that we do. So the, the act of sitting for someone as, um, Ashley was saying that part of this project that she's involved in, the training to be a sitter on MDMA, it takes time. It takes understanding. It takes doing it yourself. And then it becomes educated, experienced intuition that you use those, that your education, your experience, and then intuition. Um, because of the doors that got shut, and I was charging around while the doors were shut with a pound of mushrooms in my trunk and <laughs> dispensing because I, and I found healing. I wanted everybody to have this. And I had a boyfriend who was a, an MD and lived in Palos Verdes, and he looked at my trunk and went, oh my God, what are you doing driving up and down the highway with this? Of course, he thought of himself with a license, you know, that he would get in trouble if he were in the car with me. And that was sort of my first wake up that I really did need to be mindful that I, I could get myself in a lot of trouble and be locked up for a long time. So I had to pull, reel myself back in a bit and become much more aware of the culture at large and pay attention in that way. The good part of having to reel myself in was that I, like Stan developed holotropic breath work, which is now practiced all over the world with over 800 facilitators trained and that usher people from spiritual emergency into emergent states, paradigm shifts with that practice. So I took all that I learned and created Touching Essence, which is a neo-shamanic, multi-sensory, touch-based healing art form. I teach Esalen Massage, which is, um, I'll say it's more energy work than it is body work. It can go into body work, but it is much softer than body work. It work, it, you know what cranial sacral work is? It's much more like cranial sacral than it would be like shiatsu. And learning to deeply listen to tissue and to sense the nervous system in each person that we touch and to communicate non-verbally with the nervous system so that the watchdog <laughs> who keeps us safe, the fight or flight, takes a nap. And while it's napping, then we can do our healing work. If we work too fast or too deep, <laughs> So if we invade the safe space of this organism that we are touching, it alerts the protective mechanism. And that is a lot what sitting is. It's listening, it's being quiet, it's observing, noticing, seeing with eyes, seeing with ears, seeing with heart, and something else I wrote up here that goes with the AWARE project is inherent in all of these ways of becoming more fully human. Awareness. And awareness is something we have for ourselves. In my early teachings, learnings, awareness was confused with attention. 
and I learned to distinguish this from with Gabrielle Roth, who John mentioned, who was a remarkable downloader of healing arts practices, who ended up at Esalen with a knee injury, thought she'd never dance again, stood up in the middle of a Fritz Perls Gestalt workshop, and she said, I can't stand it anymore. I don't want to hear anybody talk about their mother. I want to bash pillows. I, we need to move. And she basically created moving gestalt, how you get up and move your feelings and move your thoughts and turn it into ultimately theater. That was her love, is, is ritual theater based on authentic gut feelings and acting out anger and acting out fear and acting out and sadness and working with the five basic simple Taoist feeling states. So she downloaded a brilliant practice, which is now spread all over the world, which I am a teacher of. And out of that, I birthed my practice, which is called Spirit Dance Soul Song, that invo involves finding your voice through sounding and singing and chanting, moaning and groaning, and whatever else we need to do to get this voice of ours free. And. So that's the good news about the door being shut. It forced people like me to find other ways. If I'd been out in the world, I might have gone really underground, but I was at Esalen on the staff and faculty. So I had find, to find other ways to help people heal themselves. How do we make psychedelics relevant in today's world? as a part of education. I think it requires that, that there was some, some thought. We did some conferences at Esalen in the late 90s, and this topic arose, and it was almost as if we needed to change the name. There's such a bad image that comes up in most people's minds when we say psychedelic. What does that word actually mean? Mind expanding, I think. And so it begins with just that word. That would be the first. We could say indigenous plant medicine, which is, I'll say Terence had a preference for plant-based medicine, whereas Stan really embraced LSD because that was the one that was so healing for him. And, um, since those were my two main teachers, I also did a lot of work with Native Americans, with the Lakota Sioux tribes, with um, some of the coastal California uh, practitioners sitting up all night in teepees and fire ceremonies and sweat lodges and vision quest. I'll say that our Native American teachers you know, they dance for five days before they go do whatever they do, day and night. They have sun dances and spirit dances, and they are wisdom keepers for how to live a sustainable life on this planet. And I'm sure if you pay a lot of attention to what's going on, you're aware of what's going on in North Dakota right now the Dakota Access Pipeline, which they are really making a valiant stand. And anything we can do to support that by, right now we're all supposed to be writing President Obama, telling him not to, you know, to really use his executive power to uphold the treaty that we signed as a country and we violate regularly. And that it is time now for power to the people. I think that's another aspect of this education, that it is time for we the people to take the power back from the more money-based people who are in power in the moment. And all it takes is unity. We just have to get together because our numbers far outweigh theirs. Um, one of the things that I got immediately, and this is a Terence from taking psilocybin, was my relationship to nature, to trees, to plants, to earth. And Terence said that that is one of the gifts and the intentions in taking psychedelic medicines is to reestablish our symbiotic 
relationship with the plant world. And that that was the hope for us revivifying, whether it was the Amazon, he was particularly concerned about the decimation of the Amazon rainforest by companies like McDonald's to uh, graze cattle. And that it certainly did that for me, is to, I, I, I did a little study for him for a month, and it's where I smoked DMT every morning before I got up. I just woke up and smoked, smoked DMT, and then I took notes. <laughs> and that, I had, I'd lived in a loft, the very, you know, not, not very deep, and I had a skylight bigger than me right over my body, and I had these beautiful plants that hung in there. And that's when they started to <laughs> talking to me, telling me things like, okay, okay, okay. And <laughs> so I can say that the overall broad experience that whether it was with ayahuasca or psilocybin or DMT, whatever the medicine was, that it was reestablishing a relationship with nature. And at the same time, I happened to live on a ranch, a 350-acre ranch, and anything I took on that ranch, I had to take off. So I learned to be an environmentalist, an ecologist. I learned to have a little bag of garbage about this big once a month that I took somewhere to Esalen and put it in a trash can or somewhere. And everything else I reused or removed or recycled or burned or composted so I became an eco-terrorist as a result of that. And I'm just appalled at what I see going on everywhere. California is one of the more progressive, particularly San Francisco. And um, I was just in China working recently. The amount of post-consumer waste that goes on over there, oh my God, I know it's going in the ocean or the landfill or wherever it goes, is just astounding. So part of what we get when we reestablish our symbiotic relationship, our interdependence, is the practice of permaculture, which is gaining a lot of traction, whether it's rooftop gardens or... And permaculture is not just gardening, it's a way of life. It, it is what I've just talked about, is that it's circular, that there's no away. I can't throw this away. There's no such place as that now. How does that affect my purchasing? You know, when I buy something, what am I going to do with this after I use it? How will I reuse it? Is it possible? Maybe I don't really need that. Um, so that was one of the effects it had on me. Partial, part of it was how I lived. Part of it was being a desolate. But most of it was the medicine itself. Um, Another teacher at Esalen, who is a Benedictine monk, celibate and contemplative, he's in his 90s now, Brother David Steinorest, any of you know of him? Remarkable human, absolutely. Uh, he had several PhDs, one in clinical psych, and he learned Aramaic and Greek so he could read the original text of the Bible and many other texts. And he demystified all of that for me, and I got a, a deep understanding of how we in the Judaic Christian world were misled, I'll say, by the translations that took place in the second and third century that left out a lot of important words or replaced words in an attempt, again, to get social control over the wild and crazy ecstatic Christians running them up. So, so, the brother David is the one who taught me, die every night you go to bed. Just die to everything that you've been attached to or holding on to and wake up new every morning. This is not unlike the Native American way, that you get up every morning, you put your feet on the ground, you say thank you for the earth, you splash some cold water on your face, thank you for water, take a breath. Thank you for breath. The sun came up. It's a new day. 
And so these very simple, basic practices uh, are, I'll say, part of that came as a result of me taking these medicines. Trauma, healing from trauma. I mentioned that one ayahuasca session, but I had many different sessions with sitters, without sitters, in group, sitting up all night in a teepee, singing our prayers, keeping the beat with a drum and shaking a rattle, and watching people. These, this happened to be one teepee, I think, of a, a woman who had an eating disorder. And toward, oh, the wee hours of the morning, at two or three, they started passing around a coating for the throat because some of the medicine had been smoked and it was um, soothing, but it had a sugar base, I can't remember, some kind of cough syrup. And this woman just reached her hand into the honey jar and started, and we were all just holding the beat and singing and watching her. <laughs> and the road chief, the woman in charge, started singing, we are here loving you in this place. That was the refrain to the song we had been singing, and we sang that for an hour. While she became, she became aware all of a sudden of what she was doing. And then became self-conscious and fearful and in process. And we just kept singing. And she got loved through that process. And the next morning when we got together in a more sober state or a more uh, grounded, I guess grounded would be the word, state, she was able to talk about this. And in ensuing months and years, she was able to deal with her eating disorder. That had healed it, that process. So whether it's body work, some of you in here are body workers like I am, I have done some sessions with people doing body work on certain medicines that can be very healing, whether it's MDMA, or I know that at Esalen, mushrooms were used widely when they were doing raw fins and because it opens the optic nerve and then you can actually see through tissue with some of these medicines. With ayahuasca, I could see through people and see bones, you know, you can see the skeleton and see muscles and see where things are held. So it, any of these medicines that open the optic nerve are very helpful to do in a, an appropriate setting. Yes? Is it beneficial for the person giving the massage to also be um, You mean giving and receiving both? Yeah, like, like the person actually receiving the massage, is it good to... Well, they would be the one. Oh, they would be the one. Yeah. And I would say that in the role of sitter or facilitator, uh, it's certainly true in the shamanic, that with the shamans I've known that have come out of South America or other cultures, there's called a shamanic dose, which is a light, just enough to put the person in the field, but not under being conscious and present and capable of functioning. Um, let me see what I wrote up here to remind me. Intention. Intention. So if, if it is to party, you know, if you want to do these medicines recreationally, which I say, is, you know, was not how I was inducted, and it's not my choice. It's not that I don't enjoy. A much lighter dose is appropriate if you want to have a lighter energy with people in a setting. I did go to a few Grateful Dead shows with some real Die in the Woods deadheads and took a little light dose of some MDMA and it made me sweeter. I'll say. I looked at everything <laughs> from a much sweeter perspective and just I just thought that was one of the greatest things I'd ever seen happen was that many people, thousands and thousands of people coming together for a love in. I took I also went to Grateful Dead shows and took nothing and I also thought the same thing. But it was a little sweeter. It sweetened it up a little bit with a light dose. Um 
I'd say the, play, the way that people get themselves in trouble with psychedelics is using too often is one thing we can blow our circuits out too high a dose for body weight or desired intention so it's useful to work with somebody who knows has experience to ask questions and get information I think right now on MAPS website um, Erwin, there are a number of websites where you can read useful information about each of these medicines. A couple, uh, he's deceased now, but Sasha and Ann Shulgin wrote several Bibles of psychedelics and that are available. Are they, are they useful, John? Yes, they are. They have yeah. a lot of information. Yeah. A lot of them recipes, actually. <laughs> yeah. So, we can send a follow-up email that answers that answer some of these questions. I'm happy to write that and then Ashley and Caitlin will send it out. So we have just a few minutes left, about 10 minutes until we close. So again, pop up questions. If I haven't answered, ask, addressed anything you wanted to know, please remind me. Yes? Uh, what is your experience with microdosing psychedelics? and anything to do with uh, anxiety or depression. So, let, I had a, a friend, a colleague, a professional, one of my early teachers, who used to take a 100 microgram tablet of LSD and squish it, make it powder, and then he, every day for a week. So he took a 100 grams, so I guess that would be about 12 grams a day. 12 milligrams. <laughs> and that worked really well for him. That was valid, and he said it was a beautiful experience and useful for him. I know somebody else who tried microdosing ayahuasca, and on about the seventh day, he had a full blown ayahuasca experience on Carmel Beach which was not the place to do that. <laughs> so I think it, you need to know the medicine and if it builds up in the system. So that, that's my experience. I would say anxiety and depression. I know somebody else was mentioning that to me earlier. I'd say what, what we use, whether, whether it's a tricyclic prescribed by an MD, or whether it's a plant-based medicine, that these are here for us as a bridge while we work on our deeper issues yeah. that were the cause of needing this. So it's not like I'm going to take this the rest of my life any more than I'm going to take any other medicine that would be prescribed, that I'm using this as a support while I make inquiry into what I'm wrapped around here. What's got me held captive? The peyote works successfully with that too. What? The peyote works good with that. Peyote? Yeah, it works good. With, with microdosing? Microdosing. Did you hear that? Yeah. With your seeds also. In microdosing. Okay. We chose seeds? With your seeds? Woodrow. Woodrose. 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 Oh, Woodrose. Yeah. Okay. They, yeah. they both work. I've treated people both with those. Okay. But again, it's the doorway, as you said, to do the work, not long term. I'm afraid there's no escape doing the work. <laughs> <laughs> we all wish. <laughs> Have you ever had a, um, like a scary or uncomfortable situation that Made you want to stop? Yes. And how do you <laughs> That's when you know you're at the right place. <laughs> he who dies before he dies does not die when he dies. Meaning, that's a quote from Muhammad actually, and it is also a quote in Psychedelia that if we can die to our deepest fear and realize, die to it, not die from it, 
then we are turning fear into fearlessness or courage or curiosity. Ashley mentioned curiosity. And then we become curious. Fear is not something we want to get rid of. We want to learn to dance with it, to ask it what it's teaching us, to make friends with it, because there is real fear that the house is burning down and I better get out, or the bear's at the door, I think I'll go upstairs, or what, whatever is a warning um, that something is harmful is about to happen. And then there are all these internal fears that have to do with the future, which are useless, really. Unless we learn from them, what am I afraid of? I'm afraid I'm going to be a bag lady. Well, prepare yourself. Get a job, you know, get training, and you don't need to be a bag lady. Or well, work on yourself so you, you know. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so it's just part of it. And that's why the set and the setting are so important. That if we, if we know that if you take these, if I take these medicines often enough, that I will come face to face with some core fear. And if I'm in the right setting, then I realize this is a, a message being sent from my psyche, from my past life or some, some realm to teach me something. And if I can deal with it, then I come back and I'd say that if we're working on ourselves um, with a therapist, then we go back to the therapist and we help that experience be integrated into our daily life. I did a holotropic breathwork for a large group in Santa Barbara at the Santa Barbara Graduate Institute. This is many years ago. And a lot of people came from LA and one was a trial lawyer. It was a three-day thing and she had a transformative experience, which she had come for, uh, out of a new paradigm. But Monday, she was back in L.A. going in the courtroom, and she froze. She didn't want to do it anymore. She couldn't. She didn't feel like she could show up in that way and start rah, 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 whatever a trial attorney has to do. So I had to send in some help in L.A., because I was in Big Sur, to go talk her down and get her back in her body so she could function in her hylotropic, biped, regular life mode that she wasn't out here in a transcendent experience, and then how to integrate that. That's why after a major opening, we need somebody to help us pull it back into, and now, how does this make my life better today? How do I embody this? How do I, and this could also help answer what you're talking about. If we can make it relevant to how does this make us better humans, better able to function and lead a meaningful life and better planetary citizens or galactic citizens that you know we got a lot going on with the other galaxies and the cosmos and so how do i take this one experience whether i did it on the playa at burning man or i did it in a how do i how does this make me more fully alive awake aware conscious curious involved in the whole experience of life. How is this possible? And I'd say that if we don't have that part, most of it becomes, you know, okay, so that was fun. Now, back to the grind. Um, I'd say that's an ongoing inquiry. It's how do we do this? Projects like the one that Ashley's involved in, that MAPS, I give Rick a big hands high five for all his dedication of 30 years in, in doing the groundbreaking work. Um, he got his PhD in public policy at Harvard. He interrupted that to start MAPS and then he went back and completed it. So it gives him viability with the government. And this project that Ashley's involved in I sat with Michael Mithoffer and Annie in their home in December last year. Of Actually, it was December of 14. And they had just met with the heads of the armed forces, you know, the Army and the Navy and the Marines, and the Surgeon General. And they were all talking about PTSD in 
veterans, and it was it's epidemic. It's a horrible situation. And they used MDMA in enough studies that the Surgeon General and the head, they said, we got to get over this issue in the culture at large. And so that was a huge boost in the arm of MAPS, of, of getting this research pushed through so that it makes this all available to people who need it. Is it time? Yeah, we got like two minutes. Okay, mm -hmm. two minutes. Mm -hmm. What's the, what? What do we need to say? I was wondering if you could oh. speak to the paradigm shifts there that you have written at the bottom, right? Yeah. Does that speak to because the military itself is a domination institution, right? right. So it's really ironic that they're kind of waking up inside that system, right? How do you get the paradigm shift outside of the system, or how to dissolve, essentially? Baby steps, huh? Baby steps. Well, if we can get a, if we could get all the military on it, then they'd just quit. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to turn all them on, right? That, I, st I, I started thinking about that. I mean, we we're the biggest warrior nation in the world right now. Somebody need it. We need to give it to everybody at Halliburton. Um, consciousness, consciousness. Yeah, Congo. Consciousness. <laughs> Dalai Lama says consciousness is a field that surrounds us and the more alive, aware, and awake we become, the engaged that we then live in this pool of consciousness. It surrounds us like our aura, like the energy field. And so I'd say that's the goal, is that the more conscious we become and then these paradigm shifts takes place and we look, I mean, I remember voting for Ronald Reagan in 1980, whatever, he ran because I didn't think whoever he was running against. I thought we, yeah, I was from Georgia. I lived in Georgia when Jimmy was governor, and I knew he was a great person, but I didn't know if he had the skills to run the country because I felt like a Republican, because I was raised as one. And it took a major shift for me to look at that and go, oh, my God. You know, I would have never done that if I had been more... Conscious, alert, alive, awake, all those things. And I'd say the more of us there are in the world, the greater the chance of the morphogenetic field spreading out and that all of a sudden Dick Cheney will wake up and say, you know, I don't think we should do this anymore. <laughs> do you remember when Ram Dass, he used to talk about keeping Casper Weinberger, who was the Secretary of Defense during Ram Dass? He always kept Casper's photo on his altar, just hoping one day Casper would wake up. And I think if we all do that, if we just hold all of these people in power all over the world, that they wake up and we visualize and affirm that, that Maybe it'll happen. <laughs> I'll say fear, fear and anger are what fuel everything that's wrong today. So it's helping people learn to properly express those. First to know that we're feeling it, and then to know how to turn anger into action. Fear into fearlessness. And that it becomes courage. And what? Curiosity. And so what I do is get people dancing. You know, that's a great bringer together and a healing art form all of itself. Freeform dance, not learning the cha-cha or the rumba. You know, not that, but this expressive arts movement that really helps us embody feelings and separate them from thoughts. Thank you so much. We'll send an email. Okay, thank you so much, Ellen. That was really great. It was really great to be able to get hear what you guys are all thinking too, because we are, you know, still new here and, and starting up. So it's really great to hear what your questions are and what your interests are. Um, just kind of to jump off of a couple of things that she spoke about, um, a new project that I'm a part of um, that I started with a friend in Los Angeles is a, um, an organization called the Inner Space Integration, and we've started doing integration services for people that have had altered state experiences and psychedelic experiences to help them integrate that. Um, we, th I know there are many people in this room too that um, 
would be um, qualified uh, health professionals um, that would be able to help with integration services. So if that's something that you're also interested in and um, or need support with, um, your project can, um, and interspace integration can help kind of point you to good, good people to help with that. 